cotton is everywhere. Of course it's in your closet in the form of your clothes. It's in your house in the form of fabrics, but it's also in your food. Think cottonseed oil. And it's even in your wallet. The very bills you use to pay for your clothes are made from cotton. Cotton is one of the most popular crops, but it also needs lots of water and pesticides. Join National Geographic explorer Alexandra Cousteau in her quest for cleaner cotton as she travels the world to find a more sustainable way to fashion. I've come to discover whether the people, textiles, and philosophy that come together here represent the future of fashion. Cousteau visits the people who clothe America. We do like to grow cotton. It's one of the crops we're very good at growing, very productive, very good quality. Germany, the forefront of sustainable fashion, and India, where farmers are changing the entire industry one plant at a time. For the love of fashion. Meet Alexandra Cousteau. She is the granddaughter of famous oceanographer and filmmaker Jacques Cousteau and a National Geographic emerging explorer. Now as a new mother, she has a concern rooted in her entire family's deep connection to the health of the planet. Approximately half of all textiles are made of cotton. The current cotton production methods are environmentally unsustainable. So to understand how this can be reversed, I'm going to travel to the cotton hotspots. My quest starts here in Berlin. Twice a year, Berlin hosts the Ethical Fashion Show, an event where designers and producers present their latest collections, most of them organic and sustainable. The Fashion Show hosts designers and brands from all over Europe. All of these innovators are environmentally conscious and work for sustainable and ethically produced clothing. But what about the common buyer? Today we purchase about 80 billion new clothes a year, almost 400% more than 20 years ago. But with such a high level of consumption, is our planet sustainable? Does organic cotton offer a solution? I'm going to a fashion store to find out what people think about it. Can I ask you a question? Have you ever heard of organic cotton? Never heard of organic cotton. No? Is organic and sustainable something that's important to you with what you eat, what you wear? It's definitely something that I think about when I'm eating, but not really something that I keep in mind as much or even at all um, with other stuff that I consume. Did you know that you're in the organic cotton section? Yeah, I did. It matters to me what I eat, so why shouldn't it matter what I wear? But what is cotton? Cotton has been used for over 7,000 years. The ancient Egyptians were one of the first to create fabrics out of cotton. Today, it is one of the most important natural fibers in the world. 35% of all clothes are made of it. 77 countries today grow cotton, mostly in hot climate zones. The three top producers are the US, China, and India, growing two-thirds of all cotton worldwide. But many say cotton is one of the dirtiest crops on the planet. It takes up to 8,000 different chemicals from pesticides protecting the plant to dyeing the final piece of clothing, making it one of the most heavily treated crops. There are three different types of cotton. First, there's GMO cotton. GMO means genetically modified organism. This type of cotton is genetically altered, so it's immune against cotton's most dangerous pest, the bullworm. Second, there is sustainable cotton, which is conventional or GMO cotton, but needs less use of fertilizers and pesticides and has less impact on water. And finally, there's organic cotton, which is grown entirely without the use of synthetic agricultural chemicals, such as fertilizers or pesticides. I'm on my way to a local fashion designer here in Berlin. They're called Slomo. Their name is their motto. They've been making clothing made only from organic cotton for 10 years. Hello. Hi. <laughs> I said I have organic clothing. Yeah, yes. right. Can you tell me more about it? Yeah. yeah. Here's different materials. It's all organic, all produced in Germany. Here, for example, you can see this is 100% organic cotton. Mm -hmm. With the colors. In the end, her collection needs to be beautiful, 
practical, comfortable. Everything that's important to consumers. But for Felicia, it also has to be made of organic cotton. And see how fine it is and how beautiful. Oh, that's beautiful. It is yeah, right. that's right. very soft. She's chosen her brand's name, Slow-Mo, because she thinks something needs to change in the fashion industry. What we want to do is redefine the textile industry by slowing down the pace and really make a system that's sustainable in every single step because the textile industry really is a dirty industry and we didn't want to support that but really find a contemporary concept which matches the 21st century. We started to do some Felicia works with her brother Melchior. They are involved in every step of making their product once the organic cotton arrives in their shop. They design it, choose the colors, the patterns, the style. Even the individual thread holding their clothes together has to be 100% organic cotton. But that's not as easy as it seems. Yeah, great. Yeah, it is. Slow-mo is the response to fast fashion, a philosophy of quick changing trends and quick manufacturing at an affordable price used by large retailers. To continue my investigation, I'm going to a country whose past is interwoven with the history of cotton farming. For the longest time, cotton production was one of the first luxury commodities after sugar and tobacco. Today, cotton production covers more than 22,000 square miles or 57,000 square kilometers of the United States. It's the crop that made America. In the 19th century, cotton made the United States an economic powerhouse. America is the leading exporter of cotton in the world. One third of all raw cotton comes from the U.S. The Cotton Belt. Lots of southern states grow cotton even today. Texas, Mississippi, and Georgia are the biggest producers. But it is here, in the San Joaquin Valley in California, usually known as the nation's salad bowl, that cotton has become a veritable hit. Here, farmer Cannon Michael is growing some of the very best cotton in America. A top shelf variety called Pima is cultivated here. We do like to grow cotton. It's one of the crops we're very good at growing, very productive, very good quality. The cotton that we grow will sell for you know, $1.50 a pound. The cotton that is grown in other parts of the world will maybe sell for 60 cents a pound. That means Michael's product is always under economic pressure. He will start seeding in eight weeks, and he has to make sure that his crop will deliver. Michael does not plant crops in the areas of his ranch, which are wetland habitats for migrating geese. Last season, he planted 1,400 acres of cotton, and this year, he is planning to grow even more. Michael's family has run this farm for six generations. He can't afford to lose it. He's decided to plant genetically modified seeds. They're more effective, predictable, and require less manpower. He has little incentive to change the way he grows cotton. Organic is much costlier for us because you get an infestation of bugs that are harder to control. You don't have as many products available to use. So if the market isn't willing to pay an extra price for it, it's not worth growing it. So and as cotton are, looks uh, and feels, of, uh, no different. From uh, last year's harvest, these bags here have the unginned or the raw cotton that would come right out of the field. There's uh, seeds from the cotton inside the fibers here. When we move over to, uh, to this bag, um, you'll see the cotton looks uh, considerably different. So once we're done with the ginning process, we have uh, nice clean cotton fibers like this that then can be sent over to the textile mills. Once harvested, most U.S. cotton is sent to Asia, where the fabric is made into clothes. Farmers like Michael are part of a fast-moving manufacturing chain. Everything has to work. At this pace, and with these stakes, very few have the stomach to change how cotton is grown in the United States. 
99% of American cotton is grown this way. Two hours drive south is the Shafter Research Station, a facility first established in 1922 by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Its mission even today, to develop high quality varieties of cotton and protect the nation's most important crop. The man in charge of this mission is Greg Palla, executive vice president of Shafter and a cotton farmer at heart. The security gated campus has half a dozen greenhouses in which Palla grows cotton year round. All sorts of varieties, most are genetically modified to engineer strains resistant to fungi and flies, but no organic cotton. Organic crops, in my opinion, are not necessarily superior to traditionally or conventionally produced crops in a variety of ways, whether it be requirements for pesticide application, fertilizer application, the necessity to do a lot of additional hand weeding that is not necessary when you can apply herbicides that are very safe from the environment, safe to workers, and to keep the cost of production low. Economics drive U.S. cotton production. The American cotton industry accounts for more than 27 billion in products and services annually, generating about 200,000 jobs in the industry sectors from farm to textile mill. At Shafter, the hope is that further refinement of gene modification can help keep the U.S. in the race. One of the most vexing problems for the farmers is the cotton plant itself. It just has a lot of leaves. When cotton was collected by hand, this was not a problem. But with giant harvesters plowing huge fields, just picking the cotton from the plant is not an option anymore. That means the plant has to be defoliated before the harvesters can begin their work. Chemicals kill the plant. Only the cotton remains and can then be harvested. Next is the ginning process. The seeds have to be separated from the cotton. The cotton lint is what makes the clothes. And the remaining seeds are collected and fed to cattle. The high fat and protein content of the cotton seeds makes it ideal for dairy cows. But one woman in America wants to change this. She fights for organic cotton for one reason. I lost my husband eight years ago. My name is Alexandra Cousteau. So far, I've learned that most cotton grown in the U.S. uses gene-modified plants, which reduces pesticide use, but doesn't completely eliminate it. But a few farmers are trying it a different way. I'm here to meet Lorray Pepper. She's an organic cotton farmer out of Texas. Now, Texas is the largest cotton-producing state in the U.S., producing about 4.5 million bales of cotton per year. But Lorray's not just a cotton farmer. She's also the managing director of the Textile Exchange, a global not-for-profit organization that works to make the textile industry more sustainable. Textile Exchange is looking for ways to accelerate organic sustainable practices in the cotton industry. Lorraine Pepper has been working with the organization for over 10 years. So why should we care about organic cotton? When you put organic production system in the mix with cotton, cotton becomes that cash crop. Then all of a sudden you're able to address food security issues because they're growing other food crops. It's about biodiversity. It's about clean water. It's not just reducing pesticides in the water, it's eliminating them. The other impact it has is on the communities and the farming families. All of a sudden, you know, husbands are dying of cancer. I lost my husband eight years ago to a cancer, a brain tumor that's found in men that are in the petrochemical and ag industries. And he grew up on a chemically intensive farm, so I've witnessed it firsthand of what it's like to deal with chemicals and impacts that they have in your life. We need to make change in agriculture. And to me, organic is that long-term solution. Cotton production touches so many lives. And so when you think about all the clothing we wear, the sheets we sleep on, the towels we dry on, it's a part of our life. I'm deeply touched by Lorraine's personal story, but she has a long way to go. Only about 1% of U.S. cotton is grown organically. I begin to think that most people simply do not know that traditional industrial cotton production is so dirty. 
and in Germany, I start to find out I may be wrong. This is Ethical Fashion Berlin, a trade show which has been taking place every year since 2011. I've come to discover whether the people, textiles and philosophy that come together here represent the future of fashion. Then the final show. One thing is clear, the fashion created by these small and independent labels is great. And I can't see any difference just because the clothes are made from organic cotton. More than 120 fashion labels are presenting their latest collections in Berlin. And at least in Germany, they're finding customers. The fair trade market expanded by 26% in 2014. I'm meeting another German designer. Barbara Gebhardt has been working with organic cotton for over 25 years. Tausend T-Shirts kann man leicht und günstig produzieren. Aber 100 T-Shirts bekommt man eigentlich nicht produziert. Und ich versuche der Kleidung den Wert, den sie hat, zurückzugeben, weil am Ende ist es immer Handarbeit, es bleibt Handarbeit. Und mein Wunsch wäre eigentlich, dass es dahin geht, dass nicht die kleineren Vorreiter unternehmen, sondern dass wirklich die Großen sich dafür einsetzen und dass diese Standards weltweit dann auch gelten. But how are the big players in the industry coping with the idea of sustainable fashion? I'm going where many Germans buy their clothes a CNA department store. CNA is one of the few big players in the clothing retail industry that has created an entire line of sustainable cotton. Hello. Hello. Can I help you? Yeah, actually, I was wondering, is this all really organic cotton? Yeah, and they merken auch schon die Qualität vom bio baum mm -hmm. And I'm curious, do you think the customers that come here, they know about organic cotton? Ja, also viele Kunden kommen halt extra auch hierher, weil sie Bio-Baumwolle zum, ich sage jetzt mal, günstigeren Preisen bekommen. Und von daher, viele Kunden sind sehr zufrieden mit der Qualität. Ja. That's great. In 2014, CNA was named the top user of organic cotton by Textile Exchange. The organization compiles the list based on the data voluntarily provided by participating companies. I wonder why a 175-year-old company like CNA has decided to place its chips on organic cotton. David Miller is the head of fabric at CNA and one of its main experts on organic cotton. CNA has made a real commitment to organic cotton. By 2020, we want to be 100% sustainable cotton fiber. At the moment, cotton accounts for around 70% of the fibers we use in the store. And that basically what we want to do between make sure that not all 100% organic, but a lot of it will be say 50 to 60 percent organic the rest will be what we call bci which is the better cotton initiative mm -hmm. which is still using gmo seeds but using better farm practices like less water less pesticides less fertilizers so it really has a less impact on the environment 100 percent the cotton by 2020 within the store will be farmed and produced in a more sustainable way so Anyone who cares about water, about wildlife and biodiversity, right. if you care about any of those things, you should care you about should organic care about, cotton. You should right? be buying organic <laughs> cotton. Yeah, you should be buying it. The other thing just to mention, we've just launched an initiative in India with the WWF, which with, uh, with the CNA Foundation for the Bengal tiger. So one of the challenges there was to, to protect the environment for the tiger, but how do you protect uh, an income for the people that live there? So organic cotton was the perfect first. If India is one of the biggest organic cotton producers, I need to go there. I arrive in Indore, the largest city of Madhya Pradesh. Here, people have been growing cotton for centuries. With a population of 1.25 billion in India, up to 6 million people work in the cotton industry staggering numbers compared to what I've seen in the United States. I drive to a little place called Katkut, a beautiful ride through rural countryside and a large tropical forest.
Central India is home to some of India's largest intact tracts of forest and iconic and endangered species like the tiger. WWF, the World Wildlife Fund for Nature, is also based in India and works to promote biodiversity conservation and more sustainable livelihoods for farmers based on organic cotton cultivation. So why does an animal rights organization like World Wildlife Fund get involved in agriculture production? I'm meeting Murli Dar, the WWF director of the Sustainable Agriculture Program in India. Why are you focusing here exactly? We are a conservation organization and the more uh, the focus of our organization is to work on the biodiversity. And this area we choose because we have seen in this area in last, uh, just in last one decade, the cotton crop uh, got doubled, right? And when the cotton crop got doubled, it brought in a lot of pesticide along with. And it may have an impact on the biodiversity in which cotton is being cultivated. So we decided to go with some sort of, you know, the path where we can phase it out uh, chemicals which is being used in the cotton gradually. Organic compliances is the right approach to go about and de-risk the area from the pesticide. And one of these beneficiaries is the Indian tiger. So by extension, this WWF project will also help to protect an endangered species. So I have seen the tiger and uh, this uh, amazing animal, incredible. Uh, and uh, it also deserves uh, you know, some sort of peaceful habitat to live. If every cotton farmer in India switched to organic cotton, would that make an impact on the amount of water and pesticide currently used? Yes, ideally, if we would switch over them from the way they are doing farming into the more sustainable, like uh, organic, then most of the problem which are tied up with the uh, environmental problem tied up with the cotton would going to be resolved. Continuing on, I come across the first fields cultivating organic cotton. It's strikingly different. Not a huge plot, but an area that one farmer or one family can work. No huge machinery. People are doing the work. Next on For the Love of Fashion, me working as a cotton picker. The women are kind enough to take a newbie like me with them, and yes, it's going to be hot and hard. I'm Alexandra Cousteau, and I'm in India to see how organic cotton is produced here. Can it be an alternative to the way traditional and industrial cotton is grown? I arrive in Sat Rundi. Tur Singh Singad and his family are performing a puja, a morning prayer. Tur Singh is a cotton farmer. One of the offerings this morning is a coconut. Tur Singh gives some of it to each family member. Now the day can begin and the adults can go to work. Tur Singh Singad began farming when he was a young man. It's a tough job, but it's what he does. For the past five years, he's been growing organic cotton on his four-acre field, and his work has never been the same since. हम बंजे से लाए रहे थे दवाई उधार और उसको बहुत ब्याज लगा रहा था। उसके बाद हमारे पास पैसे भी नहीं थे तो हम जमीन गिरवे रख के जमीन गिरवे रख के हमने उसको दवाई ला रहा था। फिर भी उसको उधार बंजे के जो पैसे 18-20 हो रहे थे दवाई के वो फिर भी अपने खेत में फसल होने के बाद भी उसका कर्जा नहीं उतर रहा था। Then he made the switch to organic cotton। फिर हमने दवाई लाना बंद कर दी तो फिर हमने घर की दवाई बनाई। ये जब एक खेती शुरू की, वहाँ से हमारे कम से कम अच्छा पैसे बचत होने लगे। पंद्रह से हर साल दस से पंद्रह हजार पे हमारा बच जाता था। तो मैंने अभी तक he is saving money by not buying pesticides, 
but most importantly, he can reuse the seed, another enormous savings. When he farmed GMO cotton, Ter Singh says he had to buy new seeds every year. The smell of cow dung lingers on the seed for over a month. No insect will harm it. No chemical repellent needed. Hmm. Wow, that's so soft and so fine. You can see each individual strand. It really does look like the cotton you imagine. But these seeds are really well hidden in there. Hard to get out. Hi. <laughs> Back in the village of Satrundi, Ter Singh invites me to a shady spot in front of his house. He brings some green chilies, and I fear that he may be preparing lunch. But no, I'm saved. What we're doing here is making an all-natural organic pesticide to put on the cotton crops. And it's a very simple recipe made up of spicy, spicy peppers, garlic, ginger, and some onions. What it does is, it helps protect the plant against some common pests like caterpillars, mites, and trips. It's a great solution because actually these are all things that the farmer can grow on his land or buy at the market for very little money. And it also keeps the land healthy, it keeps the plants healthy, it keeps the farmer and his family healthy. So it's really a win-win all the way around. Tersing needs to add water to the spicy mix, leave it for a week, and then he can use it on his cotton plants. The organic pesticides does not kill the plant or any bugs, but it makes it really uncomfortable for the insects. They stay away, just like me. Mission accomplished. Then I notice the field close to Tersing's. It's in a completely different state. Looking around this field, I'm noticing that the plants are dry and brown and missing the lush green foliage of the organic cotton fields. That's because this field is genetically modified. That demands that the farmers buy the seed every year and put pesticides and fertilizers on the plants and in the ground. Other than that, the cotton is the same. It looks the same, it feels the same, but it's not the same impact on the environment or on the farmers that grow it. Everybody in the village sees that difference. Ter Singh says he already convinced several of his neighbors to grow cotton the way he does. Next, I meet Anita Chester. She is head of sustainable raw materials at CNA Foundation. Her job is to convince more farmers like Ter Singh to take up organic cotton farming. Hey, I'm so glad you could come. Let me take you to a cotton field that's part of the organic cotton project we support. This is such an unusual plant. I know it's great. I just love coming out to the field. The movement to organic cotton, I think, is incredibly important. Cotton is such an important part of the fashion industry. It's such an important fiber. If 99% of it continues to grow the way it is, it's not a great thing. Mm. So we really have to work hard to see how cotton can be grown more sustainably. Of course, there are various things that are happening around the world, but I think a lot more needs to be done. Picking cotton is hard work, 
but it's sorely needed in this part of India, and the women working in this field can be sure that they will not get sick from chemical pesticides. Seventy-five percent of the global organic cotton comes from India, but in the past few years, that production has declined, making the job of people like Chester even harder. So, how big is the demand from the fashion side for this organic cotton? Well, cotton as an industry is huge. There's more than 26 million tons of cotton grown globally, and organic is unfortunately a very small part of it. I think. Last year, we had less than 120,000 metric tons of organic cotton in the world. Reducing the environmental impact cotton is having on our world requires participation. CNA Foundation can't do it on its own. This requires the industry to act collectively, and we are, we are supporting to catalyze an industry platform where brands can participate and you know, act collectively to invest in this space. It's called the Organic Cotton Accelerator. We already have H&M, Kering, uh, Eileen Fisher, and CNA part of it. And we hope many others will join to help us succeed in this goal. I'm on my way to Ratlam. The landscape looks much more arid. Small tribes live a very traditional life. Here, another NGO, ASA, or Action for Social Advancement, tries to improve how the tribes farm their land. The women are the mainstay of the workforce. Namaste. Namaste. <laughs> Is your family? Namaste. So this is the home that Leela shares with her family, and she also shares it with her livestock. Now the reason that the livestock are kept here in the house is, well, because they're part of the family, and it's also safer for them to spend the night indoors. An added benefit to all of this is that in the morning, Leela and her family can collect the urine and the cow dung and use it as organic fertilizer for their fields. Leela Bai has been a farmer for 20 years. She's one of the women taking classes with the ASA project, a project that helps small farmers to adopt good agriculture practices. Already, she's learned how to use the cow dung as organic fertilizer. Most of the farmers used to use pesticides that required lots of money. Two years ago, the ASA project gave Leela Bai the chance to try organic cotton cultivation. Now, not just the cotton, but all of the crops she takes care of are organic, and the farm is self-sufficient. <laughs> In this tribal area, there are no stores. There is no electricity. Sustainability is a matter of survival. Ashish Mondal runs the ASA project in Ratlam. We have a specific way of working with the villagers. The first thing that we do, we organize them into groups of 15 to 20 households. Most importantly, we take them for exposure visit to a neighboring village to show them the, how other farmers, they have adopted the organic cultivation and how they are benefiting. The project supports farmers by developing their farming skills. The work is done predominantly by women. Trainers come to the village and teach them how to use leaves, 
plants, and other natural ingredients to produce organic fertilizer, things they can find right where they live. I think uh, the very fast motivation is about the economic gain that they see. You know, I mean, by doing organic, uh, the cost of cultivation goes down. Secondly, when uh, their organic cotton is sold in the market, that gives them a very, very big, uh, you know, boost. Uh. Before I leave the village, I want to experience for myself what a day in the field is like. The women are kind enough to take a newbie like me with them. And they know it's going to be hot. <laughs> it's hard work. You're bent over for hours. And it's rough on your hands. Prying the cotton off the plant is harder than it looks. And of course, I am the slowest of the workers this afternoon. It's amazing how much cotton this group of women was able to harvest from the plants. But is this system a sustainable one that can be applied all over the world? To learn about organic cotton, I've met experts from the cotton and fashion industry, and I traveled to India to go right into the fields. What I've learned so far is that organic cotton farmers try to minimize the harmful impact of pesticides. They care about the health of the soil and conserve natural habitats. After the cotton has been collected, it's off to the nearby city, a busy little market town where farmers from as far as 20 kilometers come to sell their cotton. Bringing it here to the ginning factory. All the seeds that are inside the cotton are taken out by machine. Now this is a huge improvement over how it used to be done when everybody had to take the seeds out by hand. So being able to do it here by machine saves a lot of time and a lot of hassle. Over 700 kilograms, or 1,500 pounds of organic cotton, goes from this cart to a large pile, where it will be processed in the gin. By the end, all of the seeds are separated from the bulk, and many of them are reused. And the organic cotton is put in bales, every lot is checked, so no one is cheating. One of the reasons for these additional quality control checks. In 2010, European consumer agencies discovered that some organic cotton products of top industry brands like H&M, CNA, and Chibo actually contained genetically modified cotton fibers. After that, companies like CNA say they are making greater efforts to ensure their organic cotton is really organic and traceable. We have a supply chain that's controlled by Control Union. We have what's called TCs, transaction certificates, which monitor, they evaluate and test at the farm level right through the ginner, the spinner, to the supplier. And those TC certificates are monitored so that we should have a paper trail right through from the farm to the end product. So is it possible to actually track these t-shirts back to the farmer that grew the cotton to we make them? We can track, correct. Through the TC certificates, we can track it through each stage of the production, yes. Maybe not to the actual farmer, mm -hmm. but to the farm group, definitely, yeah. In the village of Sandva, Madhya Pradesh, I meet Shiv Lal Jadar. He has farmed his entire life, just like his father. A few years ago, he grew conventional cotton using chemicals. He says his crop was so expensive to grow that he needed to borrow money and was in danger of defaulting on his loan. He shows me the shop where he used to buy the chemical products. This is a chemical. 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 This is
बोल बनाना पड़ता है इसको और ये क्या चार सौ साढ़े चार सौ रुपये लीटर मिलता है इसमें इसमें ये इसमें करीब पचास एम एल मिला के सोलह लीटर पानी में इसको डालना पड़ता है उसमें हमारे को साल भर में कम से कम पाँच से सात बार उसको छिड़काव करना पड़ता तो उसके लिए हमारे को पैसा पंद्रह हजार से बीस हजार रुपये खर्चा हो जाता This was money he needed to borrow and repay as soon as possible. He says he used chemicals like superphosphate urea, chemicals that he does not need anymore, which will save him lots of money. India's face is changing. Girls go to school and fight for their cause too. Right across the street of the chemical shop, school girls protest for a cleaner environment. Pratiba Syntex is an organic cotton textile manufacturer which buys most of the organic cotton grown in the region of Madhya Pradesh. Over 30,000 farmers are associated with the factory working on more than 30,000 acres of farmland. Production at Pratiba Syntex has the goal that all steps are sustainable. At Pratiba Syntex they make 12,000 tons of knitted fabrics every year. 65 knitting machines use new dyeing technology. That reduces the production of wastewater by 60% and saves 30% of energy at the same time. Our intent is to convert our entire cotton production into organic fair trade cotton farming production and that is the direction we are working in. I think there is a huge disconnect between people seeing food and clothing as very separate. But as far as I am concerned, food and clothing is totally integrated. It comes from the same soil, it uses the same air, same water, same people who are there on the ground. At Pratiba Syntex, the sewing machines are humming every day. Their clothes are exported to over 20 countries. I would say organic cotton is a lot cheaper than conventional cotton. If we look at the true value of cotton, the cost that goes in water treatment, in waste management, in environmental management, in health management, which is not accounted for regularly in the products. If we see all of that, organic would be considerably cheaper. What I've seen so far at Pratiba Syntex factory is good working conditions, reasonable working hours, support for workers' families who can send their kids to school, and there's no child labor at all. My mission is accomplished. At the end of this journey, it's become clear to me that the sustainable production of cotton is not only possible, but it's a necessary way forward, benefiting people, communities, wildlife, soil, and water. Each item of clothing that we buy, from our socks to our t-shirts to our favorite pair of jeans, has a story. And for us to have a sustainable future, that story needs to start with each and every one of us. <laughs>